Hello and welcome to The Drum, I'm Steve Kinane. Coming up, the Japanese quake and tsunami disaster sparks fear of a nuclear meltdown. Should the West impose a no-fly zone over Libya? And why the federal police used tear gas on detainees at Christmas Island. Our panel tonight, former New South Wales Labor MP Meredith Bergman, science journalist and philosopher Tim Dean, and in Canberra, regular contributor to the drum website Glenn Milne. The nation of Japan is in shock, struggling to deal with the enormity of the earthquake and tsunami disaster and the nuclear emergency that's still unfolding. In the latest developments, about 2,000 bodies have been found on the shore in the worst hit area of Miyagi Prefecture and officials fear the final death toll could be more than 10,000. And there's been another explosion at the Fukushima nuclear power plant damaged by Friday's quake. The blast at the number three reactor is reported to have injured 11 people. And joining us now from Tokyo is ABC reporter Hayden Cooper. Hayden, what can you tell us about the explosion at the Fukushima plant? Look, it happened earlier today, Steve. Uh, in some ways it was expected. In fact, the chief government spokesman said last night uh, that uh, it could happen. Well, it did. Uh, the fortunate thing is that the authorities are saying that uh, it doesn't pose a major risk to human life. Uh, now, the thing blew up. It sent a whole lot of smoke and radioactive material in the air. Uh, but apparently uh, it wasn't so serious that people should be worried. Um, they say that uh, the reactor core is still protected inside its containment chamber, which is the main thing, uh, and therefore that's why they've given a fairly optimistic outlook. But having said that, they were still saying to the 600 or so people who are still inside that 20-kilometre evacuation zone that they should stay indoors. Uh, so uh, it is still uh, a, a pretty terrible development when you consider uh, the, the way this has happened that three or four days after the quake and tsunami, uh, they are still unable to, uh, to get this uh, plant at Fukushima under control. Hayden, is there any sense of how many people may have been exposed to radioactive smoke and radioactive steam that have been coming from these nuclear reactors? In the case of today's explosion, uh, about six or seven workers were injured. Now, in the case of the whole last few days since the actual earthquake, uh, there have been reports of a couple of hundred people who have been treated for exposure, but we don't really know yet if uh, there are many more than that. It could well turn out to be the case. Uh, an interesting side note this afternoon was that uh, there are reports that uh, the USS aircraft carrier Ronald Reagan, uh, which is off the coast of Japan, actually went through a cloud of radioactive material that was uh, drifting as a result of this explosion. Uh, and uh, th there have since uh, been reports that the American fleet here to help has actually moved a little bit further offshore. So they're the sorts of things we're dealing with. But I think it's still uh, a, a bit too early to say uh, with any conviction uh, how many people will need treatment or, for that matter, were exposed. Hayden, amidst all the tragedies uh, so, uh, surrounding the tsunami, the earthquake and, and now this nuclear meltdown, there have been incredible stories of survival and, and one has stood out in particular and that is the story of a man in his 60s who was found 15 kilometres offshore. It's amazing, isn't it? Uh, this guy apparently jumped on his roof uh, as the tsunami approached. Uh, his house was uh, smashed to smithereens like uh, many other houses uh, up on the northeast coast. But he clung on for dear life and uh, eventually was rescued out in the ocean. Uh, it really is a remarkable story. Uh, now, a few days on, we are starting to learn exactly what happened. Uh, there are some tales of survival, some very remarkable tales of survival. But unfortunately, there are many more um, devastating stories about what actually happened on Friday uh, and the impact on human life. Today, for example, uh, something like 2,000 bodies were discovered uh, in one stretch of, of coast. So uh, the, the numbers are really probably just going to get worse. Uh, the official death toll is still at something like 1,500, but most people do genuinely ex expect uh, that the, the final toll will be in excess of 10,000. Hayden, we'll have to leave it there, but thanks very much for talking to us. Thanks, Steve. Hayden Cooper, ABC correspondent there in Tokyo. Tim, um, as a science journalist, uh, you've been looking at, at some of the, the um, seismology issues coming out of this and, and also looking at the history of that. Uh, this is, these are not isolated incidents, these earthquakes, are they? There seem to be, in the last six years, an, an increase in the number of earthquakes. 
Yeah, it's it's quite interesting. I mean, this was a, a really this was a big one. This is this is kind of on the top end of the scale, getting up to uh, nine point zero, and the U.S. Geological Survey are calling it uh, eight point nine. The Japanese um, uh, scientists are calling it a nine. Either way, that's one of the biggest five earthquakes in recorded history, which is from around about uh, nineteen hundred. But there has been a bit of a cluster um, of big earthquakes recently, including the one in Chile not so long ago. Um, as well as uh, the one in uh, Christchurch and some other fairly significant ones. It's difficult, though, the science is unclear on exactly why they cluster in the way they do, whether it's a random distribution um, or whether there is a, is, is a kind of a, a pattern going on. Um, certainly when you look at the movements of the tectonic plates, for example, there's no uh, reason just looking at the tectonics why, say, the, um, the, the Christchurch earthquake and the uh, Japanese earthquake would be uh, related or, or, or would have some kind of causal link. Um, but there, there are lo- there's a lot we don't know. I mean, tectonic plate tectonics has only really been uh, mainstream science for about 30 or 40 years. Uh, so there's still a hell of a lot we don't know about uh, the cause uh, of these things and how they're interconnected. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm moving on to the issue of the, the nuclear reactors, and um, we've seen two of the reactors go in, into meltdown. Now, you've written previously about thorium, which is a, mm. a, a form of technology that could be used to stop nuclear reactors go into meltdown. Tell us about that. Well, thorium is, is uh, an alternative to uh, a uranium um, nuclear power, uh, power, power plant. And thorium is a slightly lighter element, so it has a different fuel cycle. Um, the reason uranium was, was used to, to generate power was because it has a fuel cycle that generates byproducts that can be used for weapons, so that the nuclear weapon industry was tied into the nuclear power industry. Uh, it could produce um, uranium-235 and plutonium, particularly plutonium. Uh, thorium, because it's a lighter element, you can create a, a nuclear reactor using thorium um, that cannot go critical because it's lighter, it's not fissile. So unlike uranium, you can pack a whole lot of thorium together and it's not going to have a runaway chain reaction. You're never going to get a meltdown. Um, So if we were using this technology today, and it's been known about for quite some time, but because it's a new technology, it hasn't been adopted yet. But if, for example, uh, these reactors in Japan were based on thorium technology, we wouldn't be having the kinds of um, issues that we're having at the moment. Meredith, uh, a lot of environmentalists want to see the expansion of nuclear energy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. What do you think this disaster, what impact will it have on the expansion of nuclear energy? Well, I think it's interesting that you say a lot of environmentalists want to expand uh, nuclear energy. I think it's younger uh, environmentalists who have never dealt with the stories of my youth, you know, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl... Um, endless pro- wind scale in, in Britain, you know, the problems of... of the huge problems of, of nuclear energy. And so I think this is... Uh, and it's, a, it's terrible to have, have happened in the middle of this tragedy, but it is a wake-up call for those people who kept saying, look, nuclear energy is the clean, you know, way forward and this is what we should be doing because they're having to face what we all faced when, you know, Three Mile Island happened. But a lot of nuclear power plant plants are not built near earthquake zones and, and are a, a, a way of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But it is not just an earthquake that can cause these problems. I mean, Three Mile Island was not caused by an earthquake. Chernobyl wasn't. They were just accidents in inside the facility. And, yes, they are becoming safer, but what... The old-style environmentalists, and I would say, is uh, they're never going to be safe enough to be able to, use for, to be used for energy. Glenn Milne, um, Joe Lieberman, the US senator who uh, chairs their, their committee there on uh, homeland security, has, has said that he, he sees that they'll put the brakes on any nuclear expansion in the short term, at least in the US, after this. Well, I think uh, anybody that's opposed to nuclear energy will seize upon what's happened uh, tragically in Japan to make their case, Uh, but they have a case. Um, And uh, I think what's going to happen around the world is that you're going to see an increasing questioning about uh, uh, the efficacy of of nuclear power and that balance, that trade-off between providing somewhat clean energy uh, for a lot of people at low cost uh, versus what can happen if there's a disaster. Uh, But I think your point's right, Steve. I mean, um, uh, Japan accounts for 20% of the earthquakes in the world. 
Uh, so it's a high-risk area. I mean, building a nuclear power plant in Australia would not entail any of those risks. Uh, but having said that, uh, I think there were stirrings on the right of the Labor Party um, in response to the left's uh, championing of gay marriage and other issues of that ilk uh, to say that we might raise the issue of nuclear power at the ALP's upcoming national conference. Uh, Martin Ferguson, uh, the Resources Minister, is known to be proponent behind the scenes of nuclear power. I think you'll now see that debate well and truly shut down. Meredith, how is Japan going to rebuild? It's going to be a real challenge for a country with public debt of 200% of their GDP. They've got an ageing population and a significant part of their, their power is gone. A third of their power comes from nuclear energy. And a lot of those reactors, I think a quarter of them, have been shut down. Yes, I was talking to people from the um, aid sector today and they were making the point that... Uh, it's going to be very different, say, to Haiti, where there was huge loss of life. 200,000 lives were lost in Haiti. But the economic uh, impact was not, was not huge because it's such a, an, an undeveloped country, whereas Japan, well, the third biggest economy in the world, uh, it's a developed country. Yes, it has debt problems, but it's a highly developed country. The economic cost there is going to be staggering, um, even if the, the human life cost is nowhere near as great as it was in Haiti. Mm. So, and it's going to be an economic cost which ripples out. I mean, already you see our stock market um, affected by it and it is, it is uh, it's very part, much part of the global village, so to speak. So uh, it's not just going to be how are they going to deal with their energy problems uh, with, with nuclear energy now being mm. very much up for uh, question. It's going to be how are they going to um, overcome what is a huge economic disaster. Well, moving on to other issues, and pressure is mounting for the United Nations Security Council to impose a no-fly zone over Libya. The Arab League held crisis talks in Cairo over the weekend, voting to support that move. And today, France is stepping up efforts to get other world powers on board, it says, to protect the citizens of Libya from the terrible violence of the Gaddafi regime. But other nations, including Russia and China, aren't convinced. So should the West intervene? Meredith, what do you think? Well, I think it's been interesting the way in which um, Obama has chosen to deal with the issue. Um, I and, and other, you know, people concerned with humanitarian issues have, have sort of been wondering why was, was he not uh, advocating a no-fly zone. But all you've got to do is think about it for a minute and think, here's a guy who has, uh, you know... Just the optics of it all, you know, Americans, and it would end up being Americans.